Howdy. The purpose of this video is to review the different kinds of bonding that I can have in a solid. Um, so why do I care about bonding in a solid? Well, let's think about a couple examples. So let's think about a steel, uh, something that's very strong yet tough. Um, let's think about a ceramic, something that can be very hard, but it's also pretty brittle. If I crack, it'll, um, it'll break easily. Finally, let's think about a plastic. Um, these are usually pretty soft and have very low melting points. So the differences between these uh, fundamental classes of materials is related back to the kind of bonding that exists between the atoms and mo molecules in those systems. So while bonding doesn't control all of the physical properties in materials, uh, it does have a very strong effect on a lot of these properties. Okay, so let's jump right into some examples. Um, First, we're going to talk about ionic bonding. Now, ionic bonding is something that occurs when we combine a very electronegative atom, something that wants to steal uh, electrons, with a very electropositive atom, something that wants to give off electrons. So remember, electronegativity um, increases as I go to the right and as I um, go higher and higher up uh, on the periodic table. Um, while the electronegativity decreases um, and atoms become more electropositive as I go to the left and as I go to lower and lower rows. So these atoms want to give up uh, electrons. They want to become cations. Electronegative atoms want to accept um, or become anions. So let's think about a couple um, examples. Let's say magnesium oxide and sodium chloride. These are two prototypical ionic solids. So magnesium oxide. Magnesium has the electronic structure of neon 3s2, while oxygen has the electronic structure of helium 2s2 2p4. Now, if you don't uh, understand this or know how to get there, uh, I'd recommend going back and reviewing the video on electronic filling rules. Um, okay, so magnesium uh, would like to, um, you know, re remember, uh, lowest energy state is usually given by full closed shells. So both of these atoms want to get to full closed shells. How would they do that? Magnesium would tend to do that by giving up its outermost two electrons. So magnesium will tend to adopt the magnesium two plus cation state. And that has a common electronic structure to the uh, noble gas neon. Uh, it has a totally closed two uh, shell, second shell. Oxygen on the other hand, would like to accept two more electrons. And so it'll tend to adopt the oxygen two minus state which also has the same electronic structure uh, as the noble gas neon. Um, a very similar thing would happen in the sodium chloride case. So you can work through this um, yourself. Uh, so what happens now? Well, now I have a positively charged cation. In this case, it has a two plus charge and a negatively charged anion. And I know that charged particles uh, will tend to interact with each other. Um, so the Coulombic potential Q1, Q2, or 4 pi, epsilon naught r. That's the, uh, the energy potential between two charged particles. Um, so if the particles have opposite charges, they'll tend to attract together. So again, a mag uh, an ionic solid is a collection of ions. They have um, largely uh, given up or accepted more electrons to uh, achieve more stable ground states. Uh, and then those particles are, um, they're charged. And so there's some electrostatic interaction between the different charged particles. Uh, ionic bonds tend to be very non-directional um, because again, that Coulombic potential is a radial potential. It doesn't matter uh, based on a particular orientation. So that's an example of an ionic solid. Next, let's think about metallic bonding. Um, so metallic bonds uh, would tend to be made by atoms that have partially filled electron orbitals. Um, 
interacting with uh, other atoms with similar, similar electronegativity. So we see metallic bonds in the alkali metals, in the alkaline earth metals, in the transition metals, and in the post-transition metals. So let's think about an example. Let's say sodium. So sodium adopts the electronic structure of neon 3s1. So if I take a collection of sodium atoms and I bring them together, uh, we know that they're attracted somehow. Sodium uh, metal is a solid material. Uh, and what happens is that these atoms come together and they have a lower overall energy if these electrons delocalize and distribute themselves throughout the solid. And so the picture that's sometimes drawn of this uh, would have um, solid sodium cores and this outermost, um, this outermost valence electron, 3s1, these electrons are given up and they're, they're distributed throughout the solid. So sometimes this is referred to as a sea of electrons uh, type of a model. And when those electrons are smeared out, distributed throughout the solid, um, the overall energy system of the state is lower. So I tend to see this bonding um, in uh, atoms that have partially filled orbitals and don't have large electronegativity differences between them. Um, so if I think about the counter case, what happens if I introduce some oxygen into that sodium system? Well, remember, oxygen has a strong electronegativity. It wants to um, grab some of these loose um, electrons. And in this case, oxygen would um, steal two electrons, sodium would uh, give up their electron, and I would have an ionic solid that looks something like this, Na2. So metallic bonding, I tend to see that uh, between um, atoms that have very similar electronegativity. So I could have um, pure metals, so pure iron, pure nickel, uh, pure cobalt, or I could have alloys. So I could have, for example, an iron nickel alloy or a copper gold alloy. Um, the key attribute here uh, is that they all have partially filled electronic orbitals and they have very, very similar electronegativity. If the electronegativity is too large, um, then I'm going to have an ionic solid. Okay, let's think about the covalent bonding case next. Now, covalent bonds um, are where we have um, atoms that share electrons in order to get a um, full closed shell. Um, so these tend to be very strong bonds and very localized. So the prototypical covalent solids are given by group four materials or some combination of surrounding materials. So for example, boron nitride, carbon, aluminum nitride, uh, silicon carbide. These are all covalently bonded uh, solids. So let's think about the carbon case for a second. This is a nice prototypical example. Carbon has four electrons, so its structure is uh, helium uh, 2s2, 2p2. And actually what we observe in the carbon case is that rather than stay separate as s and p orbitals, we have what's called hybridization between these s and p orbitals. So if I think about diamond, um, which is a pure carbon substance, um, the s and p orbitals all combine and I would have um, carbon equals 3, 2sp3. So all of those electrons are found in these hybrid sp3 orbitals. Now um, I still want to get to a closed shell and because a closed shell uh, in this case has eight electrons and carbon has four electrons, if I share each of those orbitals with a surrounding carbon atom, I can get to my full closed shell. So carbon bonding in the carbon it tends to be, um, in diamond at least, it's tetrahedral, 
Uh, and each of these sp3 orbitals overlaps and is shared by a surrounding carbon, which has its own other orbitals. So what I get in a covalent bond, I have a very localized, a very directional uh, bond. Um, these electrons, because they're localized, they're not free to move around, but it's a very strong bond. Um, and again, I tend to find covalent solids, you know, the prototypical covalent solids are uh, clustered around column four. Uh, and that's just because uh, these are the cases where I'm able to, by sharing neighboring uh, orbitals, come up with full closed shells uh, in all the cases. Now, there's, I've described three different kinds of principal or primary bonding, um, but something that's, there's something that's important to remember. We have looked at these distinct end members, but there's blurring, right? So there's a range of behavior from purely covalent to purely metallic. Um, one example would be if we go down the group four column. So carbon diamond is a purely covalent bond, or it's a very strong covalent bond. As I go to uh, larger and larger sh shells, these, um, these orbitals become more and more smeared out and the system behaves more and more metallically. So by the time I get to something like tin or something like lead, it behaves much more like a metallic bond. Um, so I could see that if I look at the melting points of the different solids as I go down. Carbon has a melting point of 3,500. Uh, silicon has a melting point of 1,400. Germanium, uh, 940. And tin, about 230. So the, um, the bonding energy gets uh, decreases as I go down um, and the electrons become uh, more and more delocalized. So by the time I get to tin, uh, those electrons are relatively able to move around and I can transport uh, current through the material. Um, I, could get, uh, I could get gradations also between uh, covalent and ionic solids. So if I think about something like sodium fluoride, that would be a very ionic solid. Um, but as I, as I move over magnesium oxide, it's also very ionic, ionic, but a little bit more covalent. As I move over again, aluminum nitride, now I'm getting more and more covalent behavior and silicon carbide uh, has an even more covalent-like um, uh, bond between it. So again, I'm moving this way with my cations and this way with my anions. I'm moving from things that have a very large difference in their electronegativity to things that have a much smaller difference in their electronegativity. So uh, when I get to the silicon carbide case, those electrons um, tend to be shared rather than entirely stripped off uh, and uh, belonging to one uh, atom rather than the other. So those are our kinds of primary bondings. Um, the next kind of bonding that I need to think about is called secondary bonding. And so you can think of um, molecules. So for example, let's think about methane, CH4. So within this molecule, I have filled up all of my orbitals. So I have carbon, there's four hydrogens around here, uh, four covalent bonds. Each hydrogen has two electrons. Each carbon uh, has eight electrons. Everything has a closed shell and it's happy. So this um, likes to exist in its independent state. But if I start to bring a bunch of methanes together, they will interact with each other to some degree. And this kind of interaction is called secondary bonding. So in this case, it's, um, I have two nonpolar uh, molecules. And so what would happen is um, I would have an induced dipole in each uh, molecule. So because neither of them has its own, uh, its own independent dipole, the electron clouds can start to fluctuate a little bit and I can have a very weak um, sort of an induced dipole between the two molecules. If I 
look at the interaction between a nonpolar molecule and a polar molecule. So let's say something like water. Water, if you remember, has a bent structure. Um, oxygen is electronegative, so, so each of these tends to have a dipole, which means that there is a net dipole in the system. So there's a little bit uh, more negative charge surrounding the oxygen, a little bit more positive charge down by the hydrogen side. So this molecule has a dipole. If it um, comes near something that's nonpolar, like methane, it can induce uh, a dipole. So this is a case where I could have a dipole-non-dipole interaction. Um, again, these tend to be pretty, uh, pretty weak. Uh, so finally, what if I consider the interactions between two polar molecules, so water to water, for example. In this case, they both have net dipoles, um, so there can be a little bit stronger interaction than in the previous cases, um, but still is relatively weak compared to primary bond. So when you think about secondary bonding, um, this is also called van der Waals bonding. Um, this is the sort of bonding that happens between molecules or atoms that are already um, electrostatically uh, happy. They've already uh, filled up all their shells, but there can still be some kind of interaction uh, between these atoms or molecules. So I see secondary bonding um, within, for example, the noble gas atoms or uh, between different molecules. One example uh, would be between different polymer molecules. So I could have a long chain of polyethylene. So each of these is a carbon sitting here. And there's two hydrogens coming off each carbon. Um, so that's one chain. And then I could have a neighboring chain. And there's, there's some interaction between these two chains because we know polyethylene can form a solid material. And so the interactions between polymer chains is oftentimes caused by secondary bonding. So the final thing that I want to point, I've already mentioned this a little bit, uh, is the bonding energy in these different kinds of bonds. So if I think about ionic, covalent, and metallic, these all can have, um, they can have a range of atom uh, bonding energies, but they're all fairly large. So ionic tends to be from about 1500 to about uh, 500. Uh, this is kilojoules per mole. Covalent uh, tend to cover about the same range. Metallic can be a little bit, uh, a little bit less. So something like uh, 1,000 to even as low as 50 uh, kilojoules per mole. So those are primary bonds. Secondary bonds, uh, on the other hand, are all much lower. Um, so uh, the Van der Waals, um, so typical secondary bonds can be on the order of about 10 to 40 kilojoules per mole. Um, hydrogen bonds, which are uh, a special case of secondary bonds, um, tend to have a little bit higher energy levels. So these are about 20 to 50 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so as a review, uh, there are a few different kinds of primary bonds, uh, covalent, um, these tend to be between materials that have very small differences in electronegativity, um, but can lead to closed atomic shells. Ionic uh, materials that have large differences in electronegativity, so they actually give up or accept electrons and be po uh, positive or negatively charged ions. Uh, and metallic bonding, so these are materials that have incomplete shells. Uh, they can't fill the shells, but they still achieve a lower energy state by delocalizing those electrons throughout the salt. Additionally, we have secondary or van der Waals bonds. This could be between induced dipoles um, between two nonpolar molecules. This could be between a permanent dipole and an induced dipole, or between two molecules with permanent dipoles. Um, hydrogen bonding is a specific case um, because when there's uh, a hydrogen atom and when it bonds to something like uh, nitrogen or oxygen, uh, it, it almost always leads to a very strong dipole in the system. Um, so those can form a little bit stronger, but still uh, much weaker than the primary bonding uh, bond strengths. And finally, and this is important, remember bonding can be gradational. Um, so I don't only have purely ionic and purely covalent. 
I could have a mixture between ionic and covalent bonds, between covalent and metallic, and between ionic and metallic bonds. Thanks.